Hello and welcome to the, this interview with Mr. John Parsons. Welcome. Technology is amazing, isn't it? But for some teenagers, unfortunately, there, have, there are dangers. So, John, what do you do in the private sector? In the private sector, I, I work with organisations helping them uh, protect their assets, their infrastructure. Um, we look at their policies, the culture of the environment. I do a lot of work in their reception areas because reception areas often let information out into the public domain that organisations would not necessarily want it to become public. So I do a lot of work with the organisations around teaching them to protect their infrastructures and by association their brand. Parents get scared, don't they? They worry about their children and technology. Do they need to? Well, the role of a parent, and, which is a guardian, is to, um, to nurture, to love and to raise a child. And we call that from the cradle to the rave, right? So as the child grows up, mom and dad empower the child with knowledge to look after themselves so that they can go off and live a, a meaningful life. And there are things in the world that um, present us with challenges as parents, and obviously technology is one of them. The most important thing is to um, help a child understand the world in which they live, based on their age and level of maturity, uh, and let them use technologies that are consistent with their values and their age. If they can start getting that right, children in a very good position. A lot of the risk comes from when you've got children that are 7, 8, 9 and 10 playing R18 games. Uh, those are some of the major risks. Or being in a social network before they're old enough to actually use it. So I think technology is neutral. Uh, it's how we uh, attach ourselves and apply ourselves to it. So how do you help people in the community? Um, for instance, I, I'm working with a family at the moment uh, with their grandfather. He's, um, he's given up something like sixty-five dollars to, to $75,000 to a criminal. Um, he lost the money on the internet. He was, he was scammed. He was tricked by somebody. He'd lost his partner of over 35, 40 years. So he was grief stricken. He was quite lonely. And he went online looking for a new partner. Uh, not so much a partner, but a companion to talk to. Um, and three people sort of targeted him through the technology, through a, a companion website. And it was actually one person that had created three different profiles. Um, and then eventually they were able to extract money from this person. And of course, that, that's a cyber crime. When I go and work with that person, we help them re-engage technology. We obviously want to make sure that they don't become a victim again. And a lot of that work is helping them understand if you present vulnerabilities about yourself to the world, then you increase the risk of being harmed in some way, depending on the context of what that expression of vulnerability is. One thing that we um, really want people to understand is that there are two things that can be used psychologically to trick someone. Um, if you trigger greed or curiosity in an individual, you can generally get them to do something. So for instance, um, if you throw a memory stick on the floor and somebody sees it, they're curious about what's on it, so they pick it up and they might take it home. So we've triggered their curiosity. Then they plug it into the computer. And if the operating system isn't up to date and there is a keylogger virus on the, on the keylogger, it can sit on the operating system of the computer. Mm -hmm. Then mom and dad come out to do some online banking. They type in their username and password and they hit enter. And the criminals get the passwords and details um, for mom and dad's bank accounts. So that's triggering curiosity in that situation there. So greed and curiosity are things that are used to trick people. Another example, if you get an email come through, you might say in the email subject line it says the IRD owe you $400. So now you're outcome focused, you're thinking of the money that the IRD owes you. So when you open the email, the next thing you've got to do is click the link. That's the task. But the person's not task focused, they're outcome focused thinking of the money. So that's the way a lot of those kind of schemes work. I do a lot of work to help people understand what that looks like. So there are a lot of sites that are inappropriate for young people to see. What can families or school, schools do to help students deal with them? For children that are very young, um, below adolescence obviously, then we can have things like uh, parental software, parental monitoring software. And I don't really like the word monitoring because that suggests that we're spying. What we're actually doing is providing guardianship. So there are applications that can be deployed on the, on the computer, on the cell phone, that can limit access to sites that mom and dad wouldn't want their child to go and be exposed to. However, that doesn't replace parenting. As the child gets older, we've got to talk to them about the world in which they live, not in a dramatic way, but talk about the world that they live in and give them knowledge on how to look after themselves, really to keep their chin up and shoulders back. One thing I want young people to understand is, is that how you express yourself in the high street or on the internet 
is really important. If we express ourselves looking vulnerable and not prepared for those environments, then we can attract the attention of people that may want to do us harm. So how we project ourselves is incredibly important. So a lot of my work with parents is helping them help their children uh, project confidence and competency, whether they're online or offline. And the big one is not for mom and dad to raise a people pleaser. We need children to become assertive. To become assertive, they need to be able to practice that within the living room with mom and dad as they grow up. I do a lot of that work. Who inspires you? Who inspires me? Oh, there are lots of people. Uh, one recently that's really inspired me is Mike King. He's just got a New Zealander of the Year for the work that he's doing. Yeah. You know, he saw an, an issue in society. Um, he moved into that area where there are health professionals and other people. And then he'd go around the country and he would engage youth. In, and he's, and the, tr the trick about someone like him, or not the trick, um, he's very authentic, is that he's a master communicator, he's passionate about the subject, and he doesn't judge people. And young people gravitate and radiate to people that are authentic. So I'm really inspired by what he's done, and I'm really pleased that he got the, um, that, that award. Another person that inspires me, uh, many years ago there was a, a, a mass outbreak of Ebola overseas. And there is a, a woman in Gore. She was a nurse, and at the time she wasn't practicing as a nurse. But when that outbreak occurred, um, she stopped working and she went overseas. She put on a nurse's uniform and she moved into villages where that outbreak was occurring. And she did that almost at the very beginning. And people were terrified of the consequences of being in the presence of people like that. A person like that needs to be celebrated. Yeah. Those kind of people inspire me. Um, yeah, absolutely. Bullying has always existed, but now it's all about cyberbullying. How can we deal with cyberbullying? I think the focus is very much on cyberbullying, but I don't think it's all about cyberbullying. You know, in the private sector, we have. Um, imbalances of power, people are being abusive to other people and we can often frame that as being bullying, uh, bullying behaviours, antisocial behaviour, but certainly cyberbullying is a major issue. Um, I think that we take the wrong approach towards it. We are continually telling schools what they've got to do to deal with it, but schools generally only have students 11% of the time. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's an issue that society needs to deal with. In the same way that we talk about speeding kills, um, my, my hope and suggestion to government would be to instead of driving it so much through the schools because it doesn't seem to be working you know apparently I've seen reports that said we're one of the worst countries in the world for cyberbullying well that would suggest that the government maybe needs to take a different approach and start funding other ideas I, I'm very passionate about dealing with the issues because I work with victims of, of very serious uh, situations around antisocial behavior but one of my suggestions would be if bullying is, very, is devastating and it's costing the economy up to $442 million a year. So maybe we could start running some advertisements once every quarter into the living room and getting mom and dad to be, you know, encouraging mom and dad to talk to their young people about the effects of bullying, whether it's cyber or offline. So I think we need to drive it more into the living room and less into the classroom. So what can we do as students to help somebody who's being cyber bullied? Um, I think the big one is find your voice and use it. Every individual in, in society uh, has a voice. And, and the, the greatest thing that we have in this country, like many other countries, we live in a democracy. And in a democracy, you have an absolute right to use your voice. Uh, we are orientated towards decency uh, and human dignity. You might not think that when you look globally at the things that we see around the world. But, but having a voice is important. And, and that that right to our own voice started hundreds of years ago. In 1215, there was something called the, the Magna Carta, which is the Great Charter. And that was the first attempt, really, to give individuals liberty and freedom, where the dictators couldn't overrun them and control their voice, if you like. And today, of course, now, we've got human rights. And that was, that was a result of conflict and war and the atrocities that we committed against people. So we are orientated towards decency and human dignity. I think what we need to be doing is, is, in education, is really talking more about human rights and then motivating young people to use their voice and speak for themselves. That's why I like people like Mike King that encourages people to speak. The most important question you can ask a young person is how are you feeling? But do it authentically and encourage them to talk. Helping a young person find their voice and speak up when they see somebody that's not being treated with respect starts in the living room where mom and dads encourage their children to talk about what they need in the world. 
and I think helping a child become assertive and speak up. So to really answer your question a bit more conclusively, if you see somebody in harm's way, if you see someone being treated without respect, think about what your values are. Think about human rights and speak up for them, either to somebody in authority that can get them help, or if you think that you've got uh, the capacity in that moment not to put yourself in harm's way, but to maybe let them know that what's happening to them is not acceptable and get them to somebody that can give them help. You're, then, you're not a bystander then. You're somebody that's actively involved in trying to make the world a better place for all of us. And remember, it is built unto us. We are orientated towards decency. Yeah. So what, say, could I do if I was getting cyberbullied? If you were getting cyberbullied, often one of the casualties of being cyberbullied is, is the voice that we lose to speak for ourselves, particularly if it goes on for a lengthy period of time. If you are being treated without respect, if your human rights are being challenged, then what you need to do is visualize in your mind who you love or trust and go towards somebody like that. And every person in this world has got someone they can go to if they take the time to think about who that person is. We have mom and dads, uncles and aunts, brothers and sisters. We have the local police. We have our doctor. There is always someone that we can go to. We have our school counselors. And I promise you, if someone has got the ability to go forward and speak for themselves, it has the potential to get much better very quickly. There's a trick that I learned when I was very young. If you're under stress and you want to go and talk to somebody to get help, and you're finding it difficult to talk to them, go and stand in front of a mirror, put your shoulders back, lift your chin, fill your lungs with air, and visualize the person in front of you and say it three times. Just practice it, role play it, and then go and talk to someone. So technology is growing unbelievably fast, so there are always all sorts of issues coming up. How can teenagers handle that well? Handle the, 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 the technology itself? Yeah, the issues yeah. coming up through technology. Okay, if you look at the human existence and how we've evolved right, over hundreds of years, technology has been around for 25 years, 30 years, and certainly from 2005, 2007, it matured very quickly into these merging social networks, okay? Um, I think we need to take a step back from the technology and look at ourselves as individuals. You know, um, how do we conduct ourselves? If we are um, positive in our behaviour in this three-dimensional space, then there's a positive outcome for us and society. It's the same using the technology. So what we've got to do to, to cope with it is not see it as a technological issue, but as a self-worth issue. Who am I as an individual? What am I like as a person? What do I want to express to the world? Technology is just a tool. We are the masters of it if we choose to take on that role. What I would say to young people is this, is surround yourself with people that love you and surround yourself with people that respect you. Those are the people that we interact with on the internet. If we're going to interact with other people outside of those two categories, then we need to change the language we use or at least what we're conveying to them. That's really important. So really learning to speak to a larger number of people now is a new skill that we need to develop. In the 80s and the 90s, we, didn't, we weren't exposed to that many people. That's what we're not used to. One of the problems also is that we would often say to you is you can't, don't speak to strangers. We need to be teaching you how to speak to strangers, not that mm. you can't. Yeah. So I think more work needs to be done in successful communication. So how would a criminal trick someone online? There are many ways, as I uh, uh, explained earlier, you trigger greed or curiosity in a person. Yeah. Uh, there's something called the scarcity principle, where you get these get, get rich quick schemes. An email comes through and says, look, if you sign up now, you're going to get a million or two million dollars. But if you don't sign up, you're not going to get the money. So you corral the person into a short time frame. They become anxious. That's triggered greed. And they comply with what the email says. Yeah. So you're, just, you're generating a situation that causes the person to not think for themselves Logically, we can do it through email, we can do it through phone calls. If a person gets a phone call from someone that they think is a scammer, simply put the phone down. You cannot be scammed and harmed if you do not communicate with the person. So it's being more assertive uh, and more controlled in our own behaviours. Yeah. There seems to be some pushback going on right now. Restrictions of what teens can look at at school, reducing the use of laptops, etc. Mm. Is that a good thing or, or is it a panic? Did we jump into technology too fast? No, I think that technology's got a role to play in our lives. We're caught by its maturation, it's matured very quickly. Yeah. 
that's what we're finding difficult to deal with. And this, this process, this evolution of technology is not going to stop. It's going to get quicker. It's going to get faster. There's no question. That's why we need to be plugged into our own values, our own human decency mm -hmm. as we use it. What I will say is this, that schools have got a right to teach. Schools have a right to create environments where the young person can come in and have an environment that, that allows them to be receptive, receptive um, to, to taking on new information. Yeah. Um, and we can do that in many ways. We can be idealistic and say that a young person can self-regulate and research is showing us that that can be very difficult for young children to do and even adults find it difficult in the private sector. So even in the private sector now, they're putting restrictions in certain ways on when you can use your technology recreationally. So within schools, some schools will take the approach of, of limiting exposure to certain sites, um, making sure that you can't use your phone by deploying software on it. And there's arguments for it and arguments against it, but schools have a right to create environments where the student can prosper and flourish. So I have no problem with that at all. So what is your opinion on AI? AI? That's, um, I'm very fascinated by, by the subject of AI for many reasons. One, um, if you look at narrow AI, which is you, you know, like chess, if you want a computer to, to, to beat someone at chess, which it did 10 years ago, there's nobody left on the planet now that will ever beat that computer. No human exists anymore that can beat that computer. So that was 10 years ago. Now that's really significant. Um, so narrow artificial intelligence means they can apply learning to a particular game, or, or, or a series of situations, and it can learn very quickly and rapidly on how to become the best player in that game. So over a week, uh, a person that studies something for a week, that narrow intelligence could be the equivalent of 20,000 years of, of, of study. We cannot comprehend or cope with that. So that's narrow AI. Then you've got general artificial intelligence, which is something that is able to go across any platform, use it, learn from it and eventually become the master of it. That's scary. Yeah. That's scary. Because we don't know where it's going to take us. We're not sure where we're going to end up. And the other part to that is that if we achieve artificial intelligence, and they've polled many scientists on this, and they think we're sort of 35 to 40 to 50 years possibly of achieving general artificial intelligence. Some people say it could be quite sooner than that. The question I have is, well, is, is the artificial intelligence, um, um, is it capable of compassion and kindness and thinking emotionally, not just logically? And then I conceived of a question that you might ask this box. This thing that can do everything, that is almost omnipresent, it's got access to every website database in the world, and it thinks at a rate of, say, 10,000 years every one hour, compared to how we can process information. And I thought, imagine if you get to a place where you walk into the room and you say to this box, we've got global warming, can you help us? So the machine thinks about that for one second, which is maybe a thousand years of processing to us. And all of a sudden, it comes back and said, I've solved your problem of global warming. We're going to terminate you as a species because you're causing it. <laughs> right? So my hope is that if we're going to go towards this artificial intelligence, before we get to that place of achieving it, we understand how to control it. Yeah. That's the important thing. Go forward 10 years, where will teenagers be with technology? A disaster or not? Well, I think that uh, teenagers today that are invested in their own personal health and well-being, who are goal-orientated, that have good social networks around them in the physical space, um, that are active, I think those people will handle and embrace this technology perfectly well. One of the issues that we're seeing globally is a lack of sleep, where technology is being used more and more. Uh, we are the only species on the planet that will deliberately try and avoid sleep. Mm. I heard a neuroscientist make that statement recently on TV, and I was stunned by that. We're the only species that will try and avoid sleep. You don't see a Labrador trying to start to watch Shortland Street or something <laughs> like that, right? We're the ones that do that. So, um, if we don't get enough sleep, it can affect our ability to take on information. If we don't get enough sleep, it can trash our immune system. And we are at increased risk of many of the diseases um, that, we, that we are exposed to. Heart attack, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, early onset of Alzheimer's. That is research that has recently come out that shows us that lack of sleep devastates our body. So I think that technology pushes us past our normal sleep patterns. And I think we need to take control of it and get back to um, good regular sleep seven days a week, surround ourselves with people that we love and people that we share the same value set with, 
learn to communicate, learn to advocate for self and others. If we can concentrate on those, those basic rights of individuals, then I think we're in a much better position to use technology safely and, and ethically. So do you have any final advice for young people? Um, yeah, I think I, I do have some final advice. You can see that I'm passionate about young people using their voice. Um, technology has revolutionised the world. Uh, and there's no doubt that it's made our lives better in many instances. We can be very focused on the negative side of it and, and then often we forget to look at the positive side of what technology has done. Globally now, when we are exposed to people that are doing things that are um, outrageous to other people, we can get online and become aware of it and challenge it. One thing that you're going to have available to you and many of the listeners today is your ability to vote. And when you're old enough to vote, please take that opportunity to vote because that helps you shape the world in which we live. There are so many young people around this world of your age that will never get the right to vote. You are fortunate and I'm fortunate to live in a democracy. And inside that democracy, we have the power to influence politicians. So the, the last thing I leave young people with is this, that when you are old enough to vote, vote, because you are then self-advocating. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Parsons. This has been very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for being here and offering your expert advice for us today. And thank you to you as well. Well done. I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you. Thank you.